Hello and welcome to another episode of Music Talks. If you haven't joined us before, we are, or we will be, the number one alternative music industry podcast. Every week, we speak to the great and the good, the movers, the shakers, the candlestick makers, the innovators, anyone we think we can learn from, and maybe you will too. If you want us to shimmy into your weekly podcast folder, just subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. And don't forget that every episode has its own dedicated Spotify playlist with tracks and artists we name check in the show, as well as anything our guests are vibing off. And this week, holy cow, our guest this week is a true selector. Search Spotify for Music Talks podcast and find out what we're talking about. And while we're name checking Spotify, it's a very Spotify heavy episode. If you want to know what's up and who's coming, get locked onto our Twitter at Hello Music Talks. Get eyes on our Insta, Hello Music Talks. And if you want to get deep into it, why not email us at, yeah, you guessed it, hello music talks at gmail.com. And remember, you won't find us on Facebook. Now, as much as we love, and we do, producing these shows for you, we do have costs, we do have overheads, we've got rent to pay, we've got to put food on the table. Help us to keep ad free and independent by showing us a little bit of cash money love. Search for Music Talks podcast over at Patreon. A small monthly pledge gets rewards for everybody. Bonus content, access to the Music Talks download archive, exclusive episodes, live stream Q and A's, and special offers. Plus anything else that we think we can throw into the mix that will make you feel like you're being rewarded. Okay, so this week we've landed a big fish. If you have any serious skin in the digital music game, and I'm looking at you major labels, streaming music platforms, heads up Rock Nation, you too Rihanna, then you'll already be familiar with this week's guest, Mr. Gregor Pryor Esquire. Quite simply, Gregor is one of the best digital music lawyers in the world. Don't let anybody tell you any different. And if you've got digital dollars to spend on legal advice, you better throw them in this man's direction. A partner at the esteemed Reed Smith Legal Practice based in the throbbing heart of the City of London, where Gregor is the joint chair of their influential global entertainment and media industry group. Equally at home in London, LA, and everywhere in between, Gregor is one of the most dialed in lawyers you'll ever have the pleasure of meeting a true music lover and someone who cares passionately about the industry and making sure that everyone plays happy and fair. What's not to like about that? Smashing stereotypes and any commonly held misconceptions that you might have about lawyers, Gregor is a true gentleman and one of the nicest guys in the business. He graciously hosted us at his London office where we found out about his thoughts on how blockchain could obliterate PROs, how managers are dominating the power pyramid, what major labels have left to offer artists, and what he believes is the coward's clause quietly tucked away in every digital license agreement. I also want to give you a heads up before we get started. There are a lot of interruptions in this episode. We call them speech bubbles. It's where I jump in and give a quick explanation of some jargon or useful background information that otherwise would have been glossed over, like a little wiki. Needless to say, we have got a hot one for you this week, and I hope you enjoy it. Without further hyperbole, let's kickstart this beast and get under the bonnet with the gorgeous Gregor Pryor. <laughs> Gregor Pryor, good to see you today. Thank you for hosting us in your office at 32 Dories High. I feel like some kind of god. Could you just give us a quick introduction for those who may not have come across you or your, your services within the music industry? I lead a team of lawyers here at Reed Smith. Um, currently, we're about 70 of us. I've worked as a lawyer in the music industry for about 16 years, predominantly working with companies that buy the use of music on a corporate level, but also have worked for record labels, publishers, artists, you know, pretty much across the board. And we, and we tend to work globally. So a lot of my work is international, so advising not only on English law, but you know, other laws 
us as well. Can you give us an idea of the client base that you work with? Any sort of names of clients you can throw out there just to sort of get us a bit more familiar with the kind of work you're talking about? So on the user side, you know, many of the digital service providers that you will know and love, ranging from the days of Napster and Music Choice to some of the more current players. So over the years, we've represented iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, and some of the more prevalent modern, I use that phrase carefully, but you know, modern distributors of music or people that use music in different ways like Musician or Codify or TikTok. So pretty broad range. And then also the broadcasters, we represent big artists. So it's a matter of public record that our firm does work for Rihanna and for Jay-Z and other, you know, very famous artists today. Okay, so it's, it's fair to say you're not really sort of kicking around on the peripheries. You're kind of stuck into the in the belly of the beast, as it were. Hopefully. In the interest of full disclosure, I've met and I've worked with Gregor in the past, as most people have, I think, who work for streaming audio platforms or other digital service providers, as that client list that Gregor just reeled off attests to. I think what would be really interesting, given the, the position that you occupy in this ecosystem, the kind of people that you're talking to and that you're dealing with, what's getting you excited today? Do you know a lot's getting me excited, right? I look at it and, and you know, having lived through this really awful period, which you will remember, of despair and litigation and villainy and yep. people losing their jobs and being concerned about unauthorized and illegal use of music and these new technologies which were so damaging to the industry. I feel like we've turned a corner to an extent and it's very, very much a different world. The success of Spotify, whether or not it's profitable, and that's another topic of discussion, but the success of Spotify and Apple, the entrance into the market of Amazon from people forget that Amazon was an early download store. You know, you're seeing real revenues being returned at least to the labels and to the publishers, but also to the artists. You know, you see the, the money that very successful artists are able to make today compared to 10, 15 years ago. It's super exciting. So that's the first exciting thing. And then the second exciting thing is kids are into music again. And that makes me really happy because for some time, there was a feeling that they had to get their music for free from somewhere. Well, I think there was it, it was a, f- a feeling, but that, that sort of sprung out of the fact that music was available for free everywhere. The music industry was, was on its uppers. There were major labels that I've worked for that saw their overall revenues drop by between 90 and 95%. To contextualise, you're talking about you know not not kids that were sort of opting to. It was free. Everybody was taking it for free, either paying directly or indirectly, and music being made more accessible across more platforms. <laughs> Okay, now this is an important one to drop in here. Obviously, I was getting a little bit carried away there because everybody knows that music isn't, wasn't, and never has been free. We know that, right? Not everyone was doing it, and if they were, it was piracy, copyright theft, unlicensed copying, whatever you call it, it was bad and against the law. Okay, hope that's cleared up. You may not be surprised, I'm pretty strict with my kids about where they get their music from. Mm -hmm. I think the family plans are a really great idea. They come under fire a bit from the rights holders because they feel that it's being given away too cheaply. But I think they're a great annuity plan because when my kids grow up and end up leaving home, they're not going to be on my family plan. I take that point and I think it's a good one. And I think that if you can take that kind of more far-sighted view of, of revenues, rather than just say, you know, family plans are driving down the, the ARPU, which at the moment for Spotify is probably what, about four or five yep. euros, something like that? Yep. Let's quickly crunch some Spotify numbers. For the first quarter of 2019, Spotify's ARPU, that's average revenue per user, had tumbled to $5.29. That's approximately four euros and 73 cents. And that's calculated on a paying subscriber base of over 100 million users. That's a drop of 2% year over year. And when I said tumbled, I mean tumbled. In Q4 2018, ARPU dropped 7%. 6% year over year in Q3, 12% year over year in Q2, and 14% year over year in Q1 2018. Any other business, and you think investors, shareholders, the board, would be getting twitchy, but not so.
data, tight margins, and the need for scale mean a long view is being taken here. The ARPU is primarily being driven down by the number of discounted student and family plans, which Gregor astutely says are fantastic annuity plans for Spotify. Spotify are investing in their future subscriber base by discounting a core demographic. This is just a cost of subscriber acquisition. And let's not forget, this strategy of funneling users, whether from the free ad-funded service or student and family plans, over to the full price premium service has always been a key element to the subscriber business model. Get them hooked for cheap or free, then funnel them down to the premium tier at the full $9.99 per month. So don't panic. Yet. <laughs> So yeah, I think that's a great counter to that argument is it is raising people to understand the value of music and the cost. You're, you're mindful of where your children get their music from. Where do they get it from? Are you hooked up to a streaming service or are they banging out sort of karaoke and uh. TikToking? And well, g given my job, I tend to make sure that the streaming service that's paying me the most money is <laughs> the one that my kids use. Um, I'm a strict believer in client loyalty. You know, left to their own devices, they do look for a pure audio experience Experience. They're not purely YouTube users, which mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. which is what a lot of people claim. Certainly, they love YouTube. Whether or not they consume their music on YouTube is another question. Something amazing happened in in our house when Alexa started to control Sonos. My son walks into the kitchen, you know, and the Sonos is hooked up to speakers around the house. And my son walks into the kitchen and just says, "Alexa, play Drake, Volume Six, Kitchen and Dining." And yeah you're away it's a game changer man I mean we're, we're, we're the same we've got a kind of weird house it's a converted cave it's like a rabbit warren and uh, getting connectivity everywhere is very difficult Right. the only way that we've been able to achieve that is multiple Alexas plugged yep. into various little networks uh, yep. around that's fantastic and that has completely changed the way that we're consuming music in, in my household do you think we're going to see anything sort of really interesting come out of voice active and I'm thinking particularly about cars given what we're hearing about sort of Spotify and work that they're doing <laughs> We have seen a bunch of news about Spotify and voice activation. If you're a premium user of the service, then you already have access to the Spotify voice control service, which allows you to voice command the Spotify platform. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see how this could work in the car if you hooked your handset up to the car system via Bluetooth or an auxiliary lead, for example. We're also seeing integrations with car manufacturers such as Volvo. Let's hear what Spotify's global head of hardware partnerships, Pascal de Moule, had to say about it. Well, we work together with Volvo to, uh, to create a, an experience of Spotify in the car, which is actually embedded in the dashboard, which is a world first. So Spotify actually lives in your dashboard. It's a beautiful uh, integration where you can actually use the touchscreen to, to access all the music in the world, or you can use the, the, the buttons on your steering wheel or any of the buttons that are in your center console. And you can actually also use your voice. So you can just speak to the radio and say, I want to listen to the boss, and it'll know the boss is Bruce Springsteen and start playing Bruce Springsteen for you. Now that was recorded back in 2013, six years ago. More recently, we've heard rumors that Spotify users in the US have received offers via the Spotify app, seemingly in error, from the company offering a standalone or hardware unit for the car at a monthly cost of between 12 and 14.99 US dollars. When these users clicked through on the Spotify app to take up the offer, they were met with an error page. Screenshots of the offer page suggest that this new device would offer voice control. Combine these reports with real life adverts placed by Spotify over a year ago now recruiting hardware engineers and I think we can safely assume that there is a hardware device with voice control designed for the car coming soon and like the old Model T Ford it will only come in one color green only kidding back to the chat <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a big car guy, right? We we actually have a team here started by me about 18 months ago. Yeah, we call it the Connected Car Team because I'm convinced that right. entertainment in the car, and we represent a couple of kind of middleware or, or providers that provide interfaces for the likes of Alexa and other voice operators, you know. The car's perfect for voice because no regulator wants the driver to be distracted. So instead of reaching down and, mm -hmm. and you know searching for something, if you can say it to the car and the car will respond. So there's a natural place for it. I think you're going to see some, I mean, Tesla's reported to have its own music service. I think Spotify has done a reasonably good job of integrating, but Apple CarPlay is really a great service. And I could see if Apple can get voice right, that could be a game changer. I've used their system in, in, uh, in BMWs. But again, it's, it's that sort of linking up the sort of user experience interface with decent, solid voice connectivity, I think, is something. Tesla did something, I remember reading something that they had done 
I think it was a hurricane or something in, in the US and people were sort of being evacuated. But the problem was, I think the 300 mile range of the Tesla vehicles <laughs> didn't get them out of the evacuation zone. So they very kindly flipped the, the switch remotely and unlocked the, the extra range. distance, the extra range that I think you had to pay something like sort of 10,000 bucks for when you ordered the, right. the car. I'm not sure if you picked this story up at the time, so let's take a quick listen to someone who has more of the detail than I clearly do. Hurricane Irma made landfall in Florida over the weekend and brought devastation to the area. In efforts to help the evacuation last week, Tesla unlocked its range limited vehicles for Florida customers, which extended the range of their vehicles and made travel easier in the terrible traffic. And Tesla spokesman confirmed to Electric that Florida owners of the Model S and the Model X vehicles temporarily had a full mileage capability of the vehicle's 75 kilowatt battery packs. And you might ask, why Tesla can't just unlock the full battery potential for all users? My limited understanding is that it's not all about cash. It goes to the fact that these are 100% battery powered cars, and the lower the battery reserve, the less reliable core safety features can become, such as steering, lights, and of course, brakes. So whilst they may have been able to make the cars go further, it's a solution that in the long term could compromise safety. I think it's a matter of time as well before you start seeing some really interesting hacks with, with Tesla vehicles. For sure. That's a conversation for, for another, sure. another time. Talking about voice recognition, what about other new technologies? Because, you know, the, the last few years we've been beaten over the head with everything from 3D TVs and augmented reality, virtual reality, voice activation, data-driven, algorithm-driven curation. Mm. What technology do you think we're gonna, that, that is going to start having more impact, perhaps? Or what new tech that maybe we haven't sort of seen or, or got our hands on do you think is going to sort of start becoming more important in, in what we do? I think there's two paths right and path one is what i would call the spotify path where there's enough capital and money purely directed at improving the user experience on a, on a really good year if i was working hard at work i'd probably spend three three and a half grand on music and that would only give me a certain amount of catalog mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was my kids you know the downside if you like of the streaming annuity model is that you've got no basis for which you're going to charge people more money for particular stuff you know, we've been through the kind of round on exclusives but i do think you know, you're going to see services like spotify apple music amazon continually competing to use AI algorithms to improve your experience. Oh, you're in San Francisco, it's morning time. I know your favorite band is whoever. You know, there's a show on this evening. You might, you know, we might kind of position you to go and see that show by pushing towards you some of their content. But this has been promised for a long time, this kind of sort of localization, this... Um concierge type sort of curation of not just music but things you know culture etc it's been promised for a long time but i haven't really sort of come across anyone that's doing it particularly well and i kind of wonder what what the difficulties can be in you know, providing that sort of some of those services got bought right i can think of a couple where you know some of the technology was there you know it knows it's early in the day right you know i've got my apple watch on it gives me a bunch of stuff mm, mm. that probably could, that apple can easily hook into and figure out how to push me music it, and it, it, it will know that if i'm on the train on the way to the office i'm going to be listening to angry hip-hop right it's very easy to make recommendations if you're making recommendations from a limited pool of choices yep right it becomes harder as that pool of choice increases you know, when you see some of the numbers today, like what Spotify getting 40,000 new tracks a, a day. day. Yep. You know, Beatport running at something like 10,000 a week. Mm -hmm. As of the time of recording, June 2019, Spotify was receiving a staggering 40,000 tracks uploaded every day. And at an average of three minutes per track, we can calculate that that's an ear busting 2,000 hours of music every day. And hey, put that calculator away, because 40,000 tracks a day is 1.2 million tracks a month. And if you are a DIY artist uploading your own productions, you better sit down. Because over the course of a year, that's 14.6 million new tracks being uploaded to Spotify alone. Just let that soak in for a minute. So as I think we've said before, the issue isn't now, how do I get my music onto a streaming platform? It's 
how do I stand out from everything else and get my track heard? Whilst the majority of these uploads are coming from independent creators, this issue of standing out from the crowd is further compounded by the fact that the major labels are raising the game even further, because not only are their existing signings pumping out more new tracks and releases, but between them, the majors are signing over 50 new artists per month. And we'll hear what Gregor has to say about the increased importance of copyright acquisition to the major's future success a little later in the show. Oh, those numbers though. Well, those kind of numbers, suddenly that pool that you're going to choose from and, and yeah. tell me what I would like and what I might like and, and what I don't want to hear becomes so vast. You have such an abundance to, to choose from that choice starts to disappear. Well, it's a data scientist dream, right? You know, I'm pretty convinced that's always going to improve. The AI is going to get better and better mm -hmm. and better. It has a bigger data set to learn from. Yeah, there is an incumbent challenge by this plethora of new, new music, this explosion of catalogue. You, the way that we enjoy that, you know, as we talk, because this is one track of the technology, just the recommendations, but there are other, I guess, ancillary or related experiences that are relevant, right? There's probably 10 new audio formats out there competing for attention right now. You know, some, you're really excellent. I'm a big champion of MQA, for example. You've got... Um, what is MQA and how does that set itself aside? And MQA isn't the only one, but there, there are a number of compression codecs or formats mm -hmm. which promise to deliver a clearer, better listening experience. So making it sound more like it sounded in the studio okay. um, through a bunch of clever patterns by altering the process by which the original file is compressed and then you know, I guess reopened, is my very rudimentary lawyer language, but reopened and, and enabled. As Gregor says, MQA is a brand new audio format, joining MP3, WAV, AAC, FLAC, WMA, etc, etc. MQA is designed specifically to transfer high resolution audio files in a manner that renders them suitable, i.e. small enough, for streaming. When we convert a studio recording to MP3, we lose around 90% of the original recording. Supposedly those areas of audio that fall outside the range of human hearing are trimmed or removed from the original sound file. In practice, this makes the file small enough to transfer over the air quickly at low bandwidth without significant audible loss of sound quality. But in reality, it seems that way more is being removed, leaving a typical MP3 file sounding tinny or lacking body when compared with the original sound recording. How does MQA do this? Well, and these are their words, not mine. MQA folds the file like origami to make it small enough to stream. We call this music origami. Really? Just when you thought you'd heard it all. Anyway, they say the unfolded file has higher audio quality than CD output and retains 100% of the original studio recording's range, however they describe it. It's good enough for them to have partnered with Tidal, Warners, Universal, Napster and Rhapsody amongst others. Get to mqa.co.uk to find out more. Back to podcast origami. These technologies have another benefit. When you look at your 40,000 songs a day, mm -hmm. The bandwidth and the storage costs for these services are massive. So these new technologies uh, okay, yes. also promise much smaller file size, more efficient compression. Got you, got you. Because, I mean, that, that, that makes a lot of sense because we've been using MP3s for probably about 15 it's years old. now. It's old, old technology and, and it's clumsy. It's like the sort of 18th century version of surgery. <laughs> you know, bite onto this and we're just going to chop this bit off and yeah. chop that, that bit off. You'll yeah. still be able to walk with what's left. <laughs> but, but if you just just on that point, if you you could couple that, and I hate to use the word blockchain, but yeah, you can couple. Yeah, well, that's never really sort of happened. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> if if you look at the way that these technologies could pot potentially be woven together, you can see an enriched experience, maybe with your visual augmented reality maybe if you want to be really extreme with virtual reality you know we represent a couple of virtual reality services that have had huge investment and, and probably will come to be very successful in future this is the one track the other track which is i think equally fascinating is the return to the human curator hooray yeah that gets my vote that the gets fan my vote the fan base so you know give me radio in san francisco small service started by a couple of beats guys all about listen it's a rich experience it's only going to be heavy metal but we're going to give you stuff that's just going to 
you know, you're going to listen to us because you're waiting to hear what's next. Okay, so Gimme Radio, like Gregor says, is based out of San Francisco and just plays heavy metal. DJs on the station include Megadeth's Dave Mustaine, a big gun right there, Randy Blythe from Lamb of God and from Swedish Viking metalers Amon Amar, Johan Hegg. That's a super group right there, just playing records. Half of what's played on the station is brand new music. They have no sponsors nor advertisers, so are truly independent. Started by ex-execs from Beats, Apple, Google Play and Rhapsody, they know what they are doing and are serving up a deep and dialed in experience to a demographic that are traditionally very loyal, i.e. happy to pay, but very underserved by most streaming platforms, metalers. Clearly it works because they've also launched Gimme Country, which serves all your, yeah, you guessed it, country needs. A large part of the playlist on Gimme is newly discovered bands and exclusive cuts and recordings. And rather coolly, they part fund the station by selling the exclusive vinyl they play on the show. And guys, please, because this always gets me, check your wiki page, because the plural of vinyl is vinyl, not vinyls. Grammar issues aside, it's a great station. And at the time of recording, it's online, it's live, and they've got iOS and Android apps if you want to dig in. I think this kind of blind following or faith in technology, you know, we're going to get, it's going to do this. It'll be much quicker, much more efficient than a human doing it. We have algorithms that will decide X, Y, and Z. Okay, well, that's great. But, um, you know, there, there are some things, getting my hair cut, for example, not that you would tell by looking at me, but there are some things I'd like a human to do. Right. A human did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some things you want, a, you want a human to do. And I think music choices is one of them. As a human, you, me, everybody, are hardwired to respond to sound in a particular way. Mm. Now, physiologically, we, a, a song can make you remember a particular moment. It can have an emotional impact on you. Mm. It can make you relaxed, make you agitated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if we if we're hardwired in this way, surely that makes us some of the best arbiters or selectors of what is a good example of a particular sound or a particular music, and not necessarily machines who are hardwired for lots of things. But appreciation of something like music is difficult. I was thinking as you were talking. You know, the old Jamaican sound system, you know, culture, the DJ wasn't called the DJ, it's called the selector. selector. yes. And, and I DJed, as you know, for many years. And my, you know, I like all kinds of music, genuinely like all kinds of music. But if I have a soft spot for any, it's for, for dance music and for hip hop. Mm-hmm. both of which are heavily reliant on the selector. And as someone who's DJed for many years, you know, I like to think that if I'm prepared to put in the hours and the time, and it's going to be very enjoyable hours and very enjoyable time, listening to new music, discovering stuff, falling in love with it, and then playing it out. That translates today because, you know, look at, look at how much Apple pay for the likes of Charlie Sloth. Mm-hmm. Right, look at mm-hmm. Rap Caviar. Yep. Look at these brands that have become, put aside all the technology, they've become hugely influential and powerful because human beings typically will be able to find an emotional connection. That's the trick, right? Music stirs your soul at its very root, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then that the art form is a human art form. And we could talk about computers making music and disrupting the PRO system because there's no copyright royalties. At its root, the art form is a human one. And also as well, I mean, we're talking about something that, that, that you get enthusiastic for, something that you can generate emotional attachments to, right. you know, a piece of music or, uh, or, or actually the physical embodiment of that music, piece of vinyl or whatever it is that you're, you're playing. A- again, I guess another sort of shortcoming of, of machine-based algorithms or machine-based curation, it's very difficult for a machine to get enthusiastic or share <laughs> your enthusiasm about something or demonstrate an emotional attachment or interest to something. If you're a music lover, those all play key parts in the music that you select and the music that you enjoy listening to. I think we're now at a stage where we need to take a step back and, and whether it's you know the likes of Apple sort of paying big bucks for, for various ex-DJs to sort of come on board and do the job for them, is maybe we're now sort of realising perhaps machines aren't quite as good or perhaps machines aren't quite as efficient uh, in performing that task. I mean, that has to be right because the, I guess, the sophistication of the input that we can give the machine is incredibly limited. So if I'm listening to... Uh, I, I th- where and when so I love a new song new grime song called Where and When right featuring gigs now the reason I love that song is because 
It talks about a big R1, which is a motorbike. I'll be, there <laughs> in, I'll be there in 10. Yeah, it makes me feel excited for the day. I love gigs, but I like his rapping voice because it reminds me, I'm proud of him as a UK rapper. Yeah. I also know that one of my kids loves the other artist. And so yeah, how does Apple know or any music service know anything about my emotional reaction to the song other than a like exactly. or that I've played it? Yeah. It doesn't know, or it doesn't know that if, if I listen to a Lee Curtis mix that makes me think of Ibiza in 2014. Yeah, right. right. Or well, Lionel Richie reminds me of being 11 years old and I feel sad. You know, there's a bunch of different things that you just, it could be, there's no way a computer can ever get there. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And I think as well, it's one of those things that if you start to do it badly, it can have ripple effects, you know? <laughs> there's no question that the... And Amazon experienced this so often with their shopping algorithms. You know, it's going to push you some crazy stuff. Someone told me once, and it may be an urban myth, but when the London riots happened, Amazon's baseball bat sales went up like 7,000%. I was going to say baseball bats and balaclavas, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the recommendation engine just went into overdrive. You know, people were being served up knuckle dusters for months after. Yeah, various parents being served out <laughs> for knuckle dusters because little Johnny's been busy helping himself with TVs. I probably love urban myths more than Snopes do, especially when they turn out to be true. But first, some context. Back in 2011, there was civil unrest in London following the fatal shooting by police of 29-year-old Mark Duggan, who at the time was travelling by taxi over Ferry Lane Bridge near Tottenham Hale Tube Station in North London. The use of police force in this instance was questionable, to say the least, and many, rightly or wrongly, saw it as another example of the application of overzealous force and racial bias by the police, except this time with fatal consequences. Young black people from the Tottenham communities are allegedly six, seven, eight times more likely to be stopped and searched than their white counterparts. Combine this with a long history of tension between the black communities and the police, including a number of deaths in custody, and you have a powder keg situation. Throw in the ability to communicate instantly via social media, and it wasn't hard to see how civil unrest, rioting and looting spread across London like wild. Wildfire. Now it's against this background that we did indeed start to see a huge rise in Amazon's sale of baseball bats, nightsticks and other equipment that could, arguably, have been used by rioters or those defending themselves and their property. Amazon's movers and shakers in the sports and leisure section of their website detailed these increases. Eight of the top ten selling items were baseball bats, with sales increases of up to 24,000%. And at the top of the charts, with a sales increase of over 50,000%, was a telescopic police nightstick. Why on earth would a telescopic police nightstick be listed in their sports and leisure section? I have no idea. That said, I can't find any record of these items being pushed to consumers by Amazon's recommendation engine. Although, as an Amazon user myself, aren't we all, I struggle to see how they wouldn't have been, certainly until they were temporarily withdrawn from sale, which they were. I guess the only thing we can be sure of is that someone always profits from a crisis. Well, okay. We, we, we're sort of we're, talk, we're talking about sort of humans versus machines at the moment. There's something else which, which, which you mentioned that um, lots of promises have been made about the blockchain technology in the music industry. I've I've seen sort of various sort of startups, whether that's tracking band names, whether it's attempting to sort of track rights. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing anything sort of interesting coming out of the blockchain technology that that's actually meaningful or having any impact? Not yet. But that's not to say it doesn't exist. No. I think as a, as a legal advisor, you're never really close enough to the nuts and bolts of exactly what's happening. What I definitely see is a lot of froth, a lot of hype, a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. a lot of people speaking at conferences as CEO of this or founder of that, uh, but not really having a business. Let's, let's think about the theoretical possibility of blockchain. If, and it's a very big if, and I've, I've been on record saying it's a pipe dream, right? But, okay, um, okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely not on the yes end of the spectrum. If we could create a climate whereby there was a ledger-based system that was incontrovertible, Mm -hmm. as evidence of exploitation or usage, then that would obliterate the PRO system in one fell swoop. It would be dead in the water because there would be no question, oh, my song got played during an ad, you know, in the middle of the Super Bowl. You know, little Johnny listened to it in the car. Car's a bad example because it's not, <laughs> it's not public performance. 
if every, and this is a long way away, but it is possible that if you could get all of the data inputs right for every single sound recording and then start to create a ledger whereby everything was tracked. Hang on, let me stop you there because what, you, what you're talking about is a level of cooperation <laughs> unprecedented in an industry that typically finds it difficult to cooperate. That's why I'm a naysayer. Yeah, in the sort of rose-tinted world where, you know, hey, everybody, we've got this great system. All you need to do is... Well, that, that, that's never going to happen because, I mean, we still don't have any kind of real comprehensive database that matches uh, master That's absolutely work. right. The catalyst, the driver for it is going to be one thing and one thing only. And I hate to say it, it's the one thing that drives our industry, which is money. Yep, yep. And if you see... Uh, an entity, let's say for argument's sake, and I know PRS has a uh, an ongoing blockchain project. Just a quick one. You will, of course, recall from episode two that the PRS, Performing Rights Society, is the UK-based collection agency that collects and distributes royalties paid for the performance of a song or composition. And a PRO, it's coming up, is a performance rights organisation, the type of organisation of which collectively the PRS is one. I know, I know, you just came here for the free drinks. Right, let's say all of a sudden they turn up and start making 50% more money than everybody else through the adoption of blockchain. You can bet your bottom dollar everyone else will jump on that. Mm. Mm. So I think that is going to be the catalyst. If someone can prove the business model and prove it in a way that people believe in, then it will be adopted. Yeah, I still struggle to, to get my head around it. I mean, you know, much as I love the PRS, they're not usually at the sort of bleeding edge of um, sort of reforming uh, the industry. I mean, let, let, let's let's remember they operated on a monopolistic basis for, well, certainly the majority of the time that they've been operating. I can think of more than one example where they've used a sledgehammer to sort of crack open a nut. But that said, I, I think we're seeing some really interesting disruption in in the collection space, whether it's companies like Cobalt coming and taking some of the, the PRS's lunch with, with AMRA, mm. the creation over the last sort of four or five years of licensing hubs. We've got Armonia across Europe, PRS on, on, on ICE and STIM and Gamer in Germany. So, you know, maybe these, these organisations that traditionally have been you know, a little bit slower and a bit sort of stuffier and, you know, the, let's be honest, the stumbling block in a lot of li- licensing negotiation. They're definitely not alone mm. in, you know, looking at blockchain because it's the most natural home for that technology in the music industry is in the collection and, and tracking space. PROs are in, in, I've spent much of my life fighting with PROs mm. on behalf of clients. We, we don't typically represent um, PROs, although we do represent a lot of publishers. I think there's been an incredible shift and some of it's way for the good and some of it's way for the bad. You know, the shift for the good has been in Europe at least, but in other countries, you now see more competition between collective rights management organizations for the repertoire of songwriters. And not so much record labels, but certainly for songwriters. It it is not some of that because some of them are doing a better job than others. They're collecting more revenues for their composers. For sure. And look, there's there's also no polite way to say it. Some of them have been corrupt and have engaged in criminal activities. And I think... The songwriter community and and some of the music publishers have said enough is enough. You know, we have very, I guess, unsatisfying exchanges with PROs when we're representing clients who want to give money to songwriters. So there is a good shift there because it, it now becomes less of a heavily regulated environment. We are seeing the European Commission loosening some of the shackles at the same time calling PROs to account. If you look at the new directive that regulates collective management organizations, 18, 90% of the obligations that are imposed upon them are for the benefit of creators. Mm. Yeah, nobody really cares too much about the distribution part of the business, but for creators, they are entitled to demand transparency, a service, you know, some fairness. So that's a good thing. Yeah. I think the downside of this is that we're seeing a race for a share of money which may or may not be legitimately claimed by rights holders. So, you know, as you know, all PROs since the beginning of time have operated a black box. You know, a black box is a bunch of money which the PRO has been unable to allocate to a particular publisher or songwriter because 
largely due to your earlier point, the data isn't matched. They're unable to match the song with you know the owner. And I think this new environment where you have direct licensing mm-hmm. and competitive licensing, almost certainly you do start to see, let's take PRS for as an example, or the gamer, hey, they can't just say, well, you give me a million quid and it's all for me to dish out. Instead, they say, well... You, you know, I've got X repertoire and, you know, Solar has this repertoire and UMPI has this repertoire and so on and so on. So that, that's the downside. But broadly, look, I never thought I'd say this, but I think PROs are improving. I think the UK PROs are, are better than most. Yeah, I'm kind of inclined to agree with you. Uh, and again, it's not something I really sort of saw my opinion on changing, especially, I mean, I, I, I remember times when, yeah, YouTube couldn't launch in Germany because they were getting screwed by Gamer for insane royalty rates. I've negotiated with most, certainly most of the PROs in Europe, and I can't think of any of those negotiations that were particularly fun. You know, this brings us on to another subject, which I think is is a good one to dig into a little bit, and that's how royalty rates, and I mean royalty rates across the board, uh, are, are, are managed. And so, on the one hand, you've got companies like the the PRS, like Gamer, that are on the sort of collection end. Um, of those royalties and how their business is being disrupted. But then if we move a, move away and look at the the actual sort of numbers um, side of it, you know, the impact that it has on bottom lines, and I'm thinking particularly the cost of master rights licensing for digital service platform and the fact that we still, we, we, we have this sort of crazy situation whereby these platforms are bringing back revenues to those companies. Yeah, that 90, 95% is now back and some, mm. yet there seems to be sort of a reluctance to loosen the leash and give a bit more margin to these people that are helping to turn your business around. <laughs> yeah, I, I was making this point to someone in a major record label the other day, and they laughed and they said, Which label? And they said, You know, distribution is a dirty business. And it made me laugh because I thought, Yeah, actually, you're probably right, you know, but. For many years, the distributors are just seen as a pain in the ass and they don't really um, you know, add any value, irrespective of the huge galactic level of private equity money that's gone into you know, the likes of Spotify and Tidal and you know, even the services that don't get much props like Deezer or Napster. You know, mm-hmm. have had massive amounts of money gone into them. The root of this, and just to illustrate the point, yeah, historically, the splits have been at the top end 60, at the bottom end 50% of net revenue for the benefit of the labels. And in the early days of streaming, the very early days of streaming, and this is where the incredible variance has happened, you know, six, seven, eight percent for publishers now, you know, creeping up to 15 percent as an accepted standard. You might argue, well, if you're looking at an aggregate royalty rate of 70 percent, well, that's still plenty of margin for these guys. The challenge that the distributors have is that the publishing community believes that the copyrights have equal value. And in radio, there are plenty Mm -hmm. of precedents for that. In synchronization as well. Yep. Okay, heads down, eyes up. An MFN is an infamous contract clause that appears in 99.99% of all digital license agreements, and I've seen most of them. MFN stands for Most Favoured Nation, and it means that if, during the course of your negotiations with, for example, a rights holder, e.g. a record label, you will increase the rate you agreed to pay me if you agree a higher rate or more favourable terms with any other party. So if I've negotiated you down to a 50% revenue, Revenue share, but have agreed a 60% revenue share with your competitor, then I must inform you and pay you that 60% instead of the 50%. So that's an uplift of 10% for you without so much as lifting a finger. Good for you. Yes, it doesn't sound equitable, but it is an industry standard. And like we just heard, distribution is a dirty business. And when we talk about sync or synchronization, we're talking about the synchronization of music and an image or video, typically with a video. So a movie, TV show, or a commercial featuring music would be examples of music and video being synchronized. And if you want to synchronize visuals with music, you will need to license the underlying copyright in the notation and or lyrics from the publisher and the master rights in the recording from the master rights owner, typically the record label. And when you do, 
you should expect an MFN in both agreements that requires each party to get no less than the other. Actually, I think I'm going to do a dedicated episode where we deep dive into how these rights are structured, the licensing procedure and the associated rates and business models. Let some cats out of their bags. Okay, back on the horse. You know, there's an MFN in sync, as you say, where it's absolute parity. Mm-hmm. When you look at historically the way that CDs were produced, where there's a statutory collectively managed rate that, that gets paid to publishers of 8%, um, and the, the sound recording rights holder takes you know, the absolute lion's share of the revenue and the download space sometimes even as high as 70%. So that disparity in a permanent ownership sense versus a transient sense. Mm -hmm. And then you look at subscription streaming, where arguably you own nothing, but you have the benefit of everything. So you've got this almost impossible argument on both sides, which will never end, I don't think, uh, for as long as there is disparity. I just want to jump back a little bit, Mm. um, because I think if we're going to talk about royalty rates and if we're going to talk about impacting bottom lines, be that record label or music service platform, Mm. we just mentioned something very briefly, but it's so important, and that is the MFN, the most favoured nations clauses within any of these licence deals, whether it's with a record label, whether it's with a publisher, a PRO, A, aren't these anti-competitive? B, can't you stand by your negotiating team's ability to do a decent deal? And if they don't do one perhaps as well as they could, then, you know, you learn for next time. Yep. Isn't this, and I, I, and I see those MFN clauses as somebody that's drafted them, negotiated them, and screwed people to the fucking floor with them. Isn't this one of the, the final sort of stumbling blocks that, that service, digital service providers are, are hamstrung by? Not just the DSPs, I would say many... MFNs have been prevalent in the industry for a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like you, I'm I'm heavily against them. I think they're cowards' insurance. I think they preclude the liquidity and you know fluidity of the market that's needed to you know make life more interesting, but also to create dynamism in deal making. So I know if you're negotiating with me, as you say, even if I'm doing a terrible deal, I can just be trued up by the MFN. And let's say I agree a rate with you that's 40, but my mate over at another major label has managed to get 60. I'm going to get the 60. It is fantastic for people like me who make their living pouring over every last word or detail. But, you know, as, as a matter of principle, I don't like them. No, I mean, I'd, I'd, I've, I've been in situations, and, and I think you, you can probably think of at least one of the ones I'm talking about, where once you've done the deals, once you've been around, you've knocked on all the doors around the world, and you've done your PROs in every territory, you've done all your publishers, you've done all your labels, your aggregators, your indies, to then have to sit down with your finance people and work out what MFNs you've got in what agreement, who comes out on top where for, for which particular parts of which deals. And that whole truing up process, it, it's like you're trying to find 120 20% of 100% pie. It is. The thing that kind of escapes everyone's attention is the absolute paucity of MFN litigation. Now, when's the last time anyone was brave enough to sue on it? And I would love it. You know, I'm always waiting for it. So just for the benefit of those listening, you have an MFN clause. How do I know as, let's say, supplier one, that supplier two has indeed got a better deal? If I'm, if I'm a rights holder and if I, if I suspect that an MFN's been breached, I can undertake an audit in the most sophisticated, bigger deal. So I can then go and speak to probably one of the big four accountants and say, hey, look, my contract allows me to compare the deals side by side. You as an independent third party you don't mm-hmm. have to and you're not entitled to disclose to me the terms of those other deals you just give me a report and tell me if i've been treated fairly or not according to the terms of the contract we've never seen any litigation around those partly because i think people have generally complied with them and they're they're accepted practice in the industry and partly because i think there's a fear of litigating about them they're accepted they're not illegal you know the the european commission has spoke very clearly about mfns when you look at the the emi you know merger approvals yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i think universal were prohibited from entering into mfns within the european period for a set period yeah um so they're not illegal. I think people. I think people get hung up on them in the context of streaming because of that disparity, and they're worried. You're absolutely right. There's nothing worse than the call I have to make 
and this is the irony of MFNs, the call I have to make to someone I negotiate with often a, a major rights holder and I say, hey, good news, you're going to get more money. And they don't view it as that. They think, bad news, my boss is going to know I didn't do as good a deal as someone else. Yeah, and I, I, I think you're right. Isn't it? I can think of more than one occasion where that's happened, not to me, but to other people. <laughs> uh, I have to say that. <laughs> you mentioned the lack of litigation around MFNs or the, the reluctance to challenge them. I think you're right. I think people are scared. You know, this industry still is a very personality-driven industry. You show respect to... It's like the mafia, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you come, you kiss the ring, you get the deal. Mm -hmm. um, don't fuck us over, because yep. if, you, if you do, we'll use that clause in our agreement that allows us to unilaterally withdraw all the content from your platform. So don't fuck with us. There's a certain way that business within this industry is predicated that makes it difficult to swim against that tide, if you like. But that still doesn't explain the, the sort of cross-the-board reluctance to, to sort of litigate on points like this. And I think another example that illustrates that reluctance is, and they've been getting away with it for so long, is the App Store tax. The 30% that I have to kick back to Apple for every transaction that happens through their, their App Store. Why has it taken Spotify so long to get off their hands and to take the fight to, to Apple's door. You know, again, as, as somebody that does this licensing, how many times have you heard, well, you know, we, we can't pay those rates because you know, we're actually netting 30% less through any transaction that happens through the App Store. So these companies are already starting on the back foot. You know, that, that £10 subscription turns into a £7 mm. subscription, for example. Why is it taking so long? Why is nobody else doing it? And why isn't it a class action suit that Apple are running uh, sorry, that Spotify are running against Apple. Okay, hands up. I'm calling this one. As in retrospect, it was more than a little unfair of me to lay this on someone who has the good grace to join me as a guest on the show. I'm sure you recall at the start of the show, I asked Gregor to regale us with some of his better known client names. He included iTunes in that list. And as a man of rare integrity, honour and bulletproof values, which I think is coming across in this conversation, how else would he have responded on this point but for doing so honestly? My bad. And huge apologies to my gracious guest for a clunky, ill judged proposition. Oops. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm probably going to disagree with you because I think there is this crazy tension as a lawyer that exists between intellectual property and competition law. And let's say I create something amazing and it's through my innovation and my effort and my investment and me being unafraid to do something different. And because it's great and because I've innovated and created this brilliant thing and it represents an amazing service and drives you know, a micro economy or an app economy that now generates many billions of dollars. Well, that's my creation. No one's forcing you to come on my app store you don't like it, go and play somewhere else. So I, I have, I have a, quite a good degree of sympathy with not just Apple, but Google in the same way and people that create operating systems. And this is more of a, a philosophical question for me as a lawyer about whether I believe, you know, because you could, you could say, well, hey, well, I wrote Billie Jean. I mean, it's a great record, but everyone should be able to share in Billie Jean. You shouldn't have to pay because it's so great. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. But Billie Jean is not the only record out there in the world. And unfortunately, I'm looking at the table now, right? There's two of us, there's two of us sitting here. You've got an iPhone. You've got an iWatch. I've got an AirPad or AirBook or whatever, whatever they're called. I've got an iPhone. We live in... Uh, a, because a, a, they're good products. They're great products. They're great products. But at what point does that become a dominant position within the marketplace? We see one of the Facebook founders coming out and saying that he thinks that Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, the Facebook group of uh, products and services need to be broken up because they're starting to have that dominance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think maybe yours is an argument as to why we haven't seen it happen yet, because arguably, and I think it's probably a tenuous argument, Apple have been sort of growing to the point at which they are at now. I think they've occupied that space from very early on, given that... You know, it's only until relatively recently that they were the, the dominant sort of uh, smartphone in right. the market. So if you want to do business with any of these Apple products, you've got to go through their closed wall store. That's right. But the, but the, the real question you've got to ask yourself is, would Spotify ever be bringing any form of complaint if Apple Music wasn't its biggest competitor? And the answer is no. 
So you have the App what? Store, and I think the the interesting. But why? I think no. And sort of, sorry to cut you cut cut you off, but why is it that other people aren't doing more to to claw back that that thirty percent? Because it's a good deal. I mean, that's the I mean that's the truth of it, right? You look at Clash of Clans, you Supercell. You look at any one of a number of King. You get any one of a number of video games businesses who've built incredible success quite happily using this ready-made platform with all its SDKs, with its global reach, with its interface, with the world's best devices. And I sound like an Apple fanboy here, I'm not. But you could see how that's a fair bargain. Apple doesn't, if Apple was 50%, maybe it would start driving people away in the early days. There's two points here that jumped to my mind. Firstly, it reminds me of the kind of margins you put on physical products, physical distribution. You know, again, I've heard this argument in, in the music business as to the value of an MP3. But we're now in an age where that distribution isn't physical. Mm-hmm. It's not about putting tangible units into crates, onto trucks, filling them up with gas, diesel, driving them up and down the length and breadth of the country. There's a lot of costs and a lot of overheads that come out. To, so to sort of start comparing, I think, and again, I think this goes towards broader reform uh, across the industry, not just in how we price products, but royalties and, uh, and other areas as well, which I'll sort of try and lead you on to later. You know, I, I think it's time for, for Apple to sort of loosen the, the 30% chain a little bit. I think it's probably becoming harder for them to justify. And having spoken to people in the mobile gaming business, my God, those th- that 30%, do you know what numbers are coming out of the iTunes store? What part of, how big that part of the business is for Apple generally? Because it must be huge. Yeah, I haven't seen the latest figures. Here we go. So you thought those Spotify upload numbers were loco? Well, hold on to your hairnets, because at Apple, everything is quantified in billions, whether it's iPad sales or downloads from the App Store. So let's just nut this out straight away. By this time last year, May 2018, the App Store saw 170 billion downloads in what was then its 10-year history. As of June last year, Apple had paid out $100 billion US to developers. So if we apply Apple's standard 3070 rev share, we can extrapolate total sales of ballpark 142 billion US dollars, 42 billion of which cruises smoothly into the Apple bank account. And how much do they net after tax? 42 billion US dollars, of course. Hey, I'm kidding, it's a joke. They pay their fair share of tax, of course they do, just like Facebook and Amazon and Google and all the other socially responsible good guys of tech. To your point about investment, I think it's deserved, right? I do, I do think inevitably the law is going to intervene when any business becomes dominant in a particular marketplace and the regulators will decide if Apple's dominant. But up until that point, you know, people just wouldn't use it unless it was excellent. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it's it's impossible to set up a something that competes and is perhaps better on the on that ecosystem. Yes, you know, Google's tried very hard with Android and has had a great deal of success. And let's not let's mm-hmm. not keep beating up Apple. You know, Google have had huge competition law issues with the way that they've operated the Android platform. So there's a temptation, I think, if you own. A bit of proprietary IP like that can that can act as a gateway to an audience to start, you know, using it in such a way that's to your advantage, and that that's Spotify's real complaint. Mm, mm. And they are, don't forget, and I know you have probably heard this before from me. You know, there's three types of distributor, right? Scooby Doo, Scrappy Doo, Shaggy. You know, Scooby Doo, big tech companies. You can argue. They've got loads of other money. They don't care about music so much. It's just part of this bigger uh, ecosystem. Scrappy-Doo, Spotify is like the best example. Pure play, all they can do is music. They kind of, you know, they've tried to diversify. Video didn't go well. Podcast looks like it's going to do better. You know, those services, Deezer, Tidal, Napster, that's a hard place to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you've got Shaggy, which are these kind of, hey, well, music could be, TikTok's the best example right now. Yeah, there's there's other stuff going on. And I think if you're Scooby-Doo, you say, well, you know what? I own this other stuff and I can bring it to bear. And and it could be to the advantage of songwriters and to the industry. Again, some important things to note. You you know, we're talking about Apple. Uh, You mentioned Amazon. 
uh, we mentioned Google. These are three companies, you know, the 900 pound gorillas in the room. Music isn't their core business. It's an adjunct to a hardware company. It's a component in a suite of software or it's part of a subscription package. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the core business for those three. I think there's, there's a distinction between the, those three particularly and a couple, company like Spotify just because of the way that their business is constructed. But perhaps more importantly, they are able to subsidise the, the music yeah. arm of their, their operations. Yep. It kind of pains me a little bit to say this, especially given that, that sort of Spotify are certainly on, still on an upward trend. But um, I still see them as the underdogs you know, in this game. Um, me too. Yeah. And again, this is something I'd be interested to get your opinion on. Do you think we're seeing uh, a sort of change in the way that particularly labels and publishers are having to conduct their business? And, and I'll, I'll give some very quick examples. Apple. Apple are now in the publishing game, have been for over, over a year. This has been a source of huge paranoia for, for rights holders, is building a distribution platform that grows and grows and grows and then is able to compete with you at your game, whether that's Apple in publishing, whether it's Spotify now allowing for direct uploads and competing with labels on, the, on a distribution basis. You've got label services companies who are offering to fill the gaps. You know, you can record your track on your, on your laptop. Sounds fantastic. Don't need the recording studio, thank you. You're managing your own fan base through social media. So we kind of got that locked off as well. The value proposition that labels have for artists is arguably becoming sort of corroded. What are your thoughts on, on that? And do you think that it is of any real impact to labels? Or is this just part of the natural sort of ebb and flow of creating music? The question I always ask the rights holders today is, what's happened to the rate at which you're acquiring new copyright? You know, how quickly are you able to generate a new work that you own or entitled to exploit as an asset for your company? Albeit you may have to return it after a while or you may have to... Mm -hmm pay out a bigger share to a creator. I think this explosion in DIY tools, services, and a marketplace, so, you know, businesses like STEM, I'm a massive fan of SoundCloud, always you know, represented that company since it started. Yep, shout out to SoundCloud for yep. sure. Massive um, innovators and as an artist today, and we see a bunch of new artists starting out, you know, we represent a really exciting jazz artist called Jacob Collier. You know, he has a very, very different outlook to the way that he manages um, and his management look after his copyrights. He, today's artists understand that they want to own and control their creative works. And I always wonder about the extent to which um, rights holders can continue to offer such a marked increase or disproportionate value. You know, if I'm a brand new artist, if I'm Stormzy, if I'm J Hus, if I'm HL, you know, why would I go to a major? What is the major offering me? And in many instances, there's a compelling answer to that question from the major. They're offering world-class expertise in marketing, in promotion, in distribution, in knowing the industry so much better. I think that's where you can stop. That's what it's been whittled down to now. Yeah. You know, it is an expertise fundamentally, I, I, I think, in promotion and marketing. doesn't matter how good the track I'm recording in my basement is. doesn't matter how many likes I'm getting on Instagram. I can't get my track playlisted on network radio across the US. I can't get it reviewed in the New York Times or the London Times. You certainly won't see me and my boy band playing before the lottery. And I think this is the, the value that record labels have that it will be harder to chip away at. And I think it's harder because record labels particularly know that if you want a hit record, it doesn't need to be a good piece of music. It doesn't need to be particularly well produced. You've just got to make people hear it. And if it's all I hear when I turn on the radio in my car and then I go into the restaurant and it's playing on there, a few days of that heavy rotation, you're humming that song, even if you hate it. And, and I think that is the, the sort of, at the moment, the sort of stone foundation is, is those relationships, those networks, that experience and that ability to make hits happen. But that was, I mean, that's always been the case. Right. Since the very early days of record labels, you know, this idea that the recorded sound, which for many in the early days of record labels was heretical. You can have this idea that someone will actually make a recording. I mean, it's a true horror that this can happen. Of course, if you've got if you can get out there 
and the label can give you a leg up or you can just throw money at the problem and you know reach an audience where you're going to have an advantage especially where there's 40,000 new songs a day however two things I think really change the game number one just virality doesn't work that way a seeding virality is if I could take you to Shoreditch which we can probably see from this window and take you to 50 companies that will promise you some form of viral hit for your content. There's not a lot of longevity to to those types of, uh, of sort of viral. No, but they get, they get you that attention, yeah. potentially for cheap. And sometimes it happens organically. Sometimes you do genuinely have. And again, SoundCloud proves this. YouTube proves it. And we can put the value gap to one side for a minute. YouTube proves it. People will share stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, for what Facebook's doing with music and what Snap are planning with music really does start to take hold. You're going to see much more amazing virality, I think. So yes, you know, you can argue that a label and a, and a publisher together could really help push and explode your career. There are, though, this, this really exciting area where you can now be famous without having to sign away your life's work to some greasy guy who's going to give you a bit of cocaine after the gig and maybe introduce you to a pretty girl mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or guy. Or guy. I agree with you. And I think it's going to be, I think we're sort of seeing the slow creep now whether that's the kind of service providers that are emerging um, that can help you, whether it's to achieve a degree of virality, um, whether it's to help you sort of crunch the data that you're getting so that as somebody that's in control of their own copyrights, you can make sort of more astute um, decisions. Or whether it's the availability of platforms that will allow you to upload your music and will pay you directly in a way that's equal or more than the royalties that you would receive from from a That's really exciting. Mm. That is really, if I look at what Google could have done, if I look at what SoundCloud is now doing, if I look at what you know, Believe's doing, if I look at what you know, these companies who are label-esque or offering really critical parts of the label, you know, the major label ecosystem, the, the one biggest change that I'm seeing in the industry is the power of managers. You know, these days, management's everything. If you've got really good management, they're going to have the chops with the record labels. They're going to easily get you a better to do and they're going to be able to explain to you and help guide you through okay well actually we don't need the label for marketing here you know we're going to start in this region we've got a better taste making sense you know rock nation i mean huge client of ours incredible business incredible foresight in the way that they approach the market but that side of the business i think is getting harder you know it wasn't that long ago when the only deal a manager needed to think about was publishing in a record deal right you know now you need people that have got the acumen to work across a number of touch points you know whether that is marketing whether it's promotion whether it's social media uh, whether it's the recording whether it's licensing in particular territories mm-hmm. how you break those territories merchandising yeah so the the tick boxes that uh, a good manager needs to be able to to put a line through are inc- have increased i think sort of dramatically over, over the years to the point at which now to your point you have people that are exceedingly good and they're being drawn into um, the music business in a way that perhaps that they weren't because there's more opportunity there. Yeah, and there's more money. In the past year, I had two hedge funds hit me up out of the blue. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, we hear you understand how music works. We want to get involved. The Hypnosis Fund just raised another 150. Yeah. The Hypnosis Song Fund is listed on the London Stock Exchange and was started by veteran industry executive Merck Mercuriadis. Merck was former CEO of the management and record label The Sanctuary Group, acquired by Universal in 2006. He was former manager of Elton John, Guns N' Roses and many, many others. Merck set up the IP acquisition fund with the sole purpose of buying up song copyright. To date, these have included compositions performed by Beyonce, Mariah, Rihanna, Bieber, David Guetta, Santana, Sheik and many, many other names that will ring your bell. The Hypnosis Fund so so far has raised 350 million pounds or 450 million dollars US which it's using on this acquisition hunt and don't expect it to stop there. Merck's target is to raise 1 billion pounds within three years of the fund's launch. This is one very astute businessman and another testament as if we needed it to the sheer volume of money that streaming services are indirectly injecting into the business. There's this investment in the copyright in the asset. So you've got the asset becoming more valued because the distribution chain is more valuable. Live is yielding real money. Merch, if you can do it properly, you know, is yielding real money. And brands, again, want a piece of the artist. They always want a piece of the of course. artist. Of course. Yeah. But, you know, they'd be more sophisticated. Red Bull, Diesel, you know, if you think about 
even the way the car companies are getting in on the game, clothing companies, fashion and music. I mean, what an exciting time to be in our industry. How long do you think that's going to go before we sort of start to see some kind of sort of plateauing? Or do you think now that there's, there's a lot of people from outside the industry with different viewpoints, different understandings of how the economics can work, different understandings of how uh, intellectual property can work, do you think that that is going to drive further changes, increased disruption, um, and move us away from the sort of you know, the paradigm that we that we use as a ref- reference point, which hasn't probably changed in a hundred years? Yeah, the, there's a big question around the you know the room for innovation. I think it's a way off at the moment because you know there is still room to grow. There's countries where there's plenty of market penetration yet to come there's much more of a global outlook for music you know, m- more acceptance of um, the Latin scene is probably the most mm-hmm. obvious example where you think, market. yeah and yeah you know, I was listening to a song the other day couldn't get a bigger bunch of producers right you had DJ mustard you had YG you had tiger and then you had absolutely pure latin artists singing you know the third verse and that was the hit verse as far as hip-hop goes and it's an obvious crossover song yeah um india is opening up albeit that legally it's a bit of a basket case um you know you could see africa almost uncharted territory for you know even though it's got its own vibrant market but it hasn't really begun to sing I think Andrew, Af- africa africa is interesting i was doing some work a board of advisors for Mdondo, which was uh, or yep. is an African, one of the first, I think, sort of yep. African services. And, and, and when I was working with uh, Martin, Martin Nielsen, I'm I know. Polish. Yeah, you know? Yep. Yeah, really nice guy. Very, guy. very smart. When I was working with him, it was very early on, and the, the service was hard to define. Didn't really know where it was going to go. But what he was doing was navigating the best route he could through uh, an industry that had no infrastructure. Right. And the interesting thing about the African market is that the distributor, the nexus between the distributor and the artist is much closer. You know, there isn't this heavy mm. reliance. So if I'm an artist, I'm thinking, why do I need someone in between me and the distributor? I'll just go straight to the distributor. But one of the problems that, that, that we had with that, now you're talking about it, I remember, um, and I'll, I'll have to get him on, on the show. Um, Martin's issue was he'd be talking with an artist that would say, yep, fine, here's my music. Yeah. But that artist had also done exclusive deals <laughs> with, with you know, service A, service B, service C. And, I, so, and so I think one of the difficulties he was having were, was sort of navigating or, or sort of working through, or let's just say dealing with perhaps a too close a proximity with, with artists who perhaps didn't have an understanding of uh-huh. the ramifications of copyright law. That well, perhaps a distributor, a label, or even a manager would. You know? This is—I mean, look, we, you can't underestimate the service that labels have provided over the years, publishers have provided over the years, to enable the creator to do what they do best. Yeah, you know, if you can have a trusted manager, trusted lawyer. Um, you know, as Biggie said, I got lawyers watching lawyers, so I don't go broke. Right? Yeah, you, man. you often have this body of people around you who can look after your financial interests and guess what you can then just get on with making music and there's there's a lot to be said for that and it almost runs counter to this question about artists being in charge of their own career the diy artist you can become so subsumed by this idea that you have to understand the business inside out and do it all yourself that it can detract from the art form Mm -hmm. i think that's definitely a problem The other thing that you have to mention in this context, because you can't ignore it, and, you know, I try and develop my own legal services business in the music industry in the same way. You know, the music music today celebrates good business. Drake sings about the way he, or raps about the way he treats the label. Jay-Z says... He's not a businessman, he's a Mm businessman. Hip-hop is is now pop. With the exception of arguably a newer breed of rappers who, like Kendrick Lamar or Tyler, the creator, who are less interested in the bling, still the majority are obsessed by, here's how much money I'm making. Whether it has moral issues, whether it has other issues that 
um, you know, the way kids are influenced and think about things. For the music business, it's been transformational. Mm, mm. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Huge revenues, huge revenues. My feeling is that when you're talking about sort of DIY detracting from the art form, I guess what you're saying is you can be a sort of jack of all trades, master of none, right? right. You're, you're trying to cover so many bases yourself, you're forgetting fundamentally about the music. Yes. The democratisation of creativity is the greatest thing that the internet delivers, right? You know, Justin Bieber was found on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I have to tell you about my history with Mr. Bieber, but that's for another time. Yeah, possibly you might need your lawyer present when you talk about that. Yeah, well, I, yeah. anyway, <laughs> democratisation of music, let's keep talking. YouTube, Bieber. I think look, it, it, it's a fascinating thing that you can reach a global audience immediately. Yeah, if you look at some of uh, TikTok's a good one, really interesting is the new voices service, which is yet to really get out there in the, in the broader marketplace. The DJ tools, the creation tools, the way that you can make, frankly, someone who sounds like shit sound awesome. And, and, and as somebody that, that, that that's played record and DJed in the past, by the same token, you can get somebody with you know sort of two left hands beat mixing perfectly. Yeah. yeah. And you know back back when I was doing it, probably when you were doing it, that was something that took you a long time to to learn how to do. Um, so yeah, I, I I get it. I think we're going to see, and look, as a lawyer, it represents a whole bunch of interesting issues around. You know, who owns what in the creative process when machines are involved so heavily, when there's these multi-layer distribution methods, when you can collaborate online, I can do a hook, you know, I can, and the artists really encourage it, yep, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I forget which Drake song, I think it, I think it was Zero to 100. And, you know, when that beat came out on, on SoundCloud or YouTube, you could hear hundreds and hundreds of very, very good, um, you know, versions based on that breakbeat. Mm -hmm. Going back to the old sound systems, you know, that, that was something that, that, that was arguably born out of very early record production, you know, where you had a bass line. I think, think of it's, you know, it's still something that happens, where you have a bass line that's used across a number mm -hmm. of different tracks. Some of them may be sort of more ballady, dance hall type thing, you know. Last of many speech bubbles this week and a tenuous excuse to drop one of the fattest bass lines this side of creation that remains a fine example of the interplay found in sound system culture. One of the most versioned rhythms to come out of Jamaica, ripped the original Wayne Smith, coming with the dance hall bass line that paved the way for all dance hall bass lines. Recycle, reuse and recreate. Before we hear some examples of what became known as the slang tang rhythm, we'll hear it played in its original form using the original instrumentation believe it or not the legendary handheld Casio Tone MT40 I think being an artist and having a career these days is more and more difficult because there's more of them, you know, and there's more and more good ones. You, you don't have to be discovered playing a greasy pub on a Friday and you just got lucky because the label guy arrived. Mm -hmm. You can do it yourself. You know, we represent kids that are influencers on YouTube, millions and millions of followers who don't have anything other than their own ingenuity in their bedroom being creative. So... That, for our industry, is a big threat, no question. And I think you know, the labels particularly having to adapt. If you were a label trying to figure out your place in the value chain and sort of adapt and survive, do you think, if you were the shareholders of that label, you'd sell 50% of that company to a Chinese company like Tencent, for example? <laughs> um, 
just a hypothetical, not really topical at all. Um, I'm a lawyer, and laws are based on governments and religions and territories. And there is a there are a bunch of reasons why entering the Chinese market, particularly, is difficult. There's very different reasons, but equally powerful reasons why entering the Russian market is difficult. Entering the African market. So the reason why music, as we know it today, digital music has taken hold. In the way it has economically in the developed or even you know U.S. Western Europe particularly, is because it's easy to enforce and to do business. I think if you are universal, to take another random example,、mm-hmm. you know, and you might want to consider having a big Chinese company own some of you, that can bring tremendous advantages. It could make the remaining fifty percent that you still hold. Be worth more than the hundred percent that you previously held. I'm almost certain that that could be right. Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be interesting to sort of see, to find out what what, what moves labels are going to make. Whether that's diversifying and increasing their their interests in film production, TV production,、uh, video games.、Um, whether it's going to be sort of spreading their investments across other sort of media forms and becoming more of more media house than record label, or Whether you're going to see a continued carve up if Vivendi do sell off、uh, half of Universal to Tencent, I think that the rewards are, are huge. You know, it opens up the biggest single market for any product or service in the planet. It immediately gives them a huge amount of local catalogue, which has been a massive problem for any label or streaming service. I think the really smart labels are going to follow what their artists want. They all have investment funds these days. Yeah, one of them is owned by an oligarch. The other one's just printing money, but has itchy shareholders. And the other one is a, is a wildly、um, successful, big technology-driven business with a heritage and a credibility that is unparalleled. They all have to make big bets to grow. But、mm-hmm. I think the the winners are going to be the labels that deliver what their artists are looking for by way of the investment of the money that they bring in from streaming. Warner is a good example where they have their fire pit investments. The Vivendi fund seems to have been subsumed, or Vivendi seems to have subsumed what used to be the Universal early stage fund. Sony quietly goes about its business, but is no less entrepreneurial either. It's just a different way of doing things. But it has incredible interest in movies, in games.、Mm-hmm. In many ways, it has a head start there. So it's a really very exciting twelve months.、And、don't underestimate what the artists and the managers are doing. You know what Scooter Braun doing. What's Rock Nation doing?、Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they are. You know, what's Ten Cent is a great example. All these guys can be huge forces of change. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's going to be interesting. I think to sort of see see where all of this goes. I think one thing's for sure: we could probably continue talking for、uh, for another hour, another two <laughs> hours. I'm conscious of the time, and I know that that particularly in this industry, time is money. <laughs> Music talks. Oh, is that it? No, thanks, Gregor. Goodbye, Gregor. Leon, how rude. Well, not really. We strayed so quickly into territory that has no place in a music podcast that a clean edit was frankly impossible. Think cars, bikes, Land Rover Defender, Nurburgring, Bitcoin. Yes,、yeah, see what I mean. So let's say it now. A huge thank you and a super massive fist bump to the immense Gregor Pryor. I love that guy. If you didn't catch episode two of the show when we spoke to Annabella Coldrick of the Music Managers Forum, get to it. It complements the topics we discuss with Gregor, especially the PRS PRO segment of the show, and gets a little deeper into some of those weeds. And if you haven't already got to it, the accompanying playlist for this show is. Firing, and it's live on Spotify right now. Just search for Music Talks podcast and hit follow. It's got all of the artists and tracks name checked in the show. Yes, even Lionel Richie. And apologies to the eleven-year-old Gregor. Now, we always ask our guests to suggest a few additional tracks for the playlist, and on this occasion, Gregor did not disappoint. What a great selection of music! And it will come as no surprise to hear that this playlist. Sounds particularly good when played in a car. Loud. This has been a long shift. You're still here, so let's wrap this up with a huge thank you, thank you, thank you for staying with us. If you enjoyed this as much as we did making it, then please subscribe and review. There are gazillions of podcasts out there, and we thank you for choosing us. 
and stick with us. We've got lots more to come. As always, get with us on Twitter and Insta. Our handle on both is Hello Music Talks. Email is hello music talks at gmail.com. And as always, we would be eternally grateful if you could get to our Patreon page and make a tiny commitment to show your support and help keep us ad free and independent so that we can keep on doing this and bring you more shows in the future. Big up to Brutal Deluxe for the amazing audio as ever. For now, I'm Leon Hill. This has been a Music Talks production and we're out of here because time's money.